so I was telling my panelists that, you know, we are going to have 200 uh, participants today. So it's looked like that, you know, I can't uh, keep up my promise. Uh, it's only 110. So tell everyone to come and join, please. Uh, welcome on board, um, uh, John, uh, Tarun, uh, Robert, uh, Terry, and, um, and Tom. Thank you again. So I wanted to pass it on to uh, Robert to formally start the session. Thank you. I think it's Terry. Yeah. Terry's in charge. It's Terry. I assume, Terry. I assume you're passing it on to me, Bala. Um, yeah, Terry's so off. I will start because I'm meant I'm to be moderating. Oh, sorry, 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 Terry. Yeah, over to Terry. Sorry. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging, as many people have already, um, the huge efforts that Bala has put into organizing such a fantastic conference. Um, and he's done it with a smile on his face, which is, is quite remarkable too. And he promised the organizing committee early on in, in our um, efforts that he would respond to emails irrespective of the time of day or night. And true to his word, he did. So congratulations on that. Um, I was part of the organizing committee for this conference, although I played a very minor role. But as I watched the process unfold, I was reminded of a very famous line from a movie that I'd seen called My Last, um, the, the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. And in that movie, um, the manager of the hotel, facing growing criticisms about how chaotic the whole organization is, comes up with this, this line and says to um, one of the guests, Madam, when, oh, madam, everything will be all right in the end. And if it's not all right, it's not the end. <laughs> I, think, I think you would all agree that it has turned out in the end, um, thanks to your efforts, Bala, to be a magnificent conference. So thank you very much. Um, today's session is about giving advice and guidance to our colleagues from four very, very highly cited scholars on how they might get published in top journals. And I think we all agree that getting published in top journals is very important because it's got major implications for your promotion prospects, for your salary, and for your career in general. But perhaps more importantly, getting published in top journals gives people a sense of joy, a sense of pride, and a sense of relief that comes when your work is acknowledged as being accepted by your community. So very, very important that we strive to get our papers published and accepted by our academic community. Um, we've got four speakers today, and as I've said, they're all highly um, regarded highly cited scholars. We're going to do this alphabetically. So Taryn will be first and then Rob, um, John and Tom. Um, <clears throat> we've got about five to 10 minutes uh, allocated for each of these speakers, but if you want a little bit more or a little bit less, um, I'm sure we can accommodate that. There's not really a structure to this other than to address that general theme of, can we provide guidance and help to our, our community on the process of getting published? So let me start with a, a brief introduction of Taryn Chordia. Um, Petco gave a very lengthy in introduction yesterday, so I won't repeat all of the things that he said, but I will just concentrate on the things that are, are particularly relevant um, in relation to Taryn's career for this particular session. As you, I think, all know, Taryn is a professor of finance at Emory University, and he joined Emory in 2000. His PhD was from Anderson School at UCLA in 1993. He, his research work covers both empirical and theoretical work, 
and spans a very, very wide area of research interests. He's published in some of the very best journals, including the Journal of Business, the Journal of Finance, the JFE, the Journal of Financial Markets, JFQA, and the Review of Financial Studies. Taryn is currently the managing editor of the Journal of Financial Markets, and that's generally regarded as being the best outlook, uh, the best outlet in the world for market microstructure research. He was also a previous editor of the Review of Financial Studies. So it seemed appropriate to me that Taryn, at least in part, addresses um, particular aspects of the JFM submission process, uh, its editorial policy, and perhaps and compares and contrasts that with his experience at RFS. Um, but I don't want to be prescriptive, Taryn, in, uh, in saying what you should cover. You are far more experienced than I am in uh, publication success. So we look forward to hearing your words of advice. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. So I'm gonna share my screen. I have a couple of slides here and hopefully you can see them, right? Uh, I have just shared my screen. Hopefully you can see them. See the screen? Yeah, okay, great. So I'm just gonna talk generally about the publication process, right? Let me start here. The referring process in finance and economics is tough, right? Maybe if you are a doctoral student and you've not submitted papers yet, you don't know this, but it is extremely tough. So let me just give you some numbers. JF receives about 1300 papers a year, publishes 65. A 95% rejection rate. Actually, the rejection rate is higher than 95% because no paper is accepted in the first round. Uh, it has a high desk rejection rate. The rejection rate at the Journal of Financial Markets is 85%. So there's just so much order flow coming in everywhere. So many papers coming in to the editorial process. JF is ranked number one out of 94 journals in business finance with an impact factor of 5.6. Of course, this is a few years ago. JF is ranked number four in 345 journals in economics. Right? The process not only is it tough, it is becoming harder. So the number of papers submitted to the top five econ journals, so I have the data from econ journals, has increased from about 3,000 in 1990 to about 5,500 in 2015. And the number of publications has declined, I'm talking of the five top econ journals, from 400 in 1970s to 300 in 2010 to 12. There's a longer page length, more co-authors, uh, and more citations. At the top schools, I think uh, Bala talked about this, Terry talked about this, research is crucial. And teaching is also very important. There is a lot of emphasis placed on good teaching. So let me ask this question uh, of the audience. What is the median number of top journal publications? Remember the median number of top journal publications by doctoral students, by top journal, I mean the top three in finance, by doctoral students from the top 30 schools over the past 30 years. So if a doctoral student has graduated from the, one of the top 30 schools over the past 30 years. What is the median number of top journal publications? Yeah, Robert's got that right, but uh, put, put a number down and I'll tell you what the real number is. The number is actually zero. The median number of top journal publications from top 30 school doctoral students is zero. Right? It, that is pretty depressing, but that's what it is. Karen, somehow you have muted yourself. How did I do that? Okay, uh, so this is just a graph showing the num total number of submissions in the top five econ journals. Right? Everything is trending up. If you look here, the average page length, this is the mean standardized page length, right? It, it has gone up and number of authors has gone up, which means lot more authors are working longer on papers, working harder on papers. Papers are becoming more involved, more complicated. 
So what constitutes a good paper? It's easy to recognize, but hard to define and prescribe, right? Uh, Dick Rohl talked about this, like, it's like pornography. You, you know when you see it, but you can't define it. You can't prescribe it. So I, I don't have any magic pill, many magic formula to tell you this is how you write a good paper, right? But I can give you some, uh, some guidelines. So content, there has to be a clear motivation. Why is this important, right? And it has to pass the elevator test in 30 seconds or one minute. You need to be able to convey to your audience, to somebody, why the work you're doing is important. Why does it matter? There has to be a clear focused argument. The quality of data has to be good. You have to use state of the art methodology with depth of detail so that uh, the results can be replicated. Assumptions have to be clearly stated. It has to be an insightful and interesting conclusion. Right? Form. Writing is very important. I can't emphasize this. Writing is extremely important. In JFM, we have a copy editor look at all the papers that are accepted before it's published. So it has to be organized in a logical sequence. There have to be effective transitions to maintain focus and advance the idea coherently. You have to have distinct paragraphs to convey information in manageable units. There has to be fluency and grace. You have to have accurately, you have to document the sources with proper citations and meticulous proofreading and editing. Use a copy editor if necessary. Do not send in sloppy work because referees are overburdened. Nobody wants to try and figure out what you're writing. In fact, at this moment, I'm referring a paper and because I'm having trouble understanding it, uh, I'm very much inclined to reject it without having read it all the way through. Right? That is the, because people are overworked. You've you got to make it easy. You've got to make it understandable for the other person. Right? So if I, I have get a paper as an editor and I read the abstract and I've read a couple of paragraphs, couple of pages in the introduction and I don't understand what's going on, that means there's something wrong with the paper. Right? You have to make it easy for the editor, for the referees. Improving the odds of pu publication. Papers should advance the field. Papers should be easy to read. No typographical errors, no grammatical mistakes, right? Top journals are looking for reasons to reject. Remember, they're getting so many papers. They're looking to reject. Papers should be clearly and simply written. Abstract introduction conclusions should be understandable to MBAs. Papers should be properly positioned. And remember, in general, regardless of how you much hate, you may hate the referees, the referees are diligent and thoughtful, right? Sometimes mistakes are made and that is when you appeal the decision, but you need to know when to fold, right? So keep in mind, referees are diligent and thoughtful. What is the new economics insight? Why is it important? For top journals, you have to make a meaningful contribution. Theory papers, right? Why is the model useful? How is it different from past models? Are there any new testable implications? What are the assumptions, strengths, weaknesses of the approach? Empirical papers, why is the finding important? You need to uh, need a clear economic justification for the empirical approach. You need to convince the reader that there's no p-hacking. Right? Check for robustness, outliers. Need to use the latest techniques. You have to persevere. Right? This is a hard process, you have to persevere. It's extremely important, if not the most important part of research, right? choosing the correct research question. Right? It takes about four to seven years from idea to publication. And if you don't get the right idea, you're wasting your time, right? It, this process is very time consuming. Theory, uh, it's important to anchor the empirical work in theory. Current topics, what's been published in recent years? Are there any pressing policy questions that can be addressed? What is going on? What, are pe what do people care about, right? Choosing the research question is important. New data, right? replication of studies using international data will not result in a top journal publication, right? You need to answer questions that cannot be answered with existing data. So I, we get a lot of papers that are just replicating US results for some of the market. That doesn't work. Choosing the research question. Choose a question that's interesting, unanswered, but potentially answerable with the tools you can muster. Look for gaps in the literature. 
know and use the scientific method avoid p hacking data mining read the journals for doctor students look for gaps in the literature when you're taking classes go to seminars and conferences the afa has a scholarship program right take advantage of it start writing papers as soon as you can get free training do as much ra work as you can for dissertation if possible write papers that can be published not not a huge book doing research present at conferences or seminar as often as possible right a discussant gives you a free referee report take as much advantage of this as you can attend seminars and conferences there are lots of really good seminars and conferences lots of good conferences ask for feedback listen to it ask for more right carefully address all comments received in seminars and conferences never never submit a first draft revise 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 right don't be in a hurry to submit what have i been working on empirical asset pricing that what's hot is what i've been working on right i have my own biases liquidity trading activity market efficiency anomalies multiple hypothesis testing financial distress uh, high frequency trading machine learning big data right? there's lots of interesting stuff happening out there list of top uh, topics with my biases empirical asset pricing p hacking data mining models and testing right the pharma french five factor they add momentum so it's become pharma french six factor there's pharma french cross section factors hu zhu zhang there's uh, barilas and shankan six factor there's a uh, stambo one uh, mispricing factors choice of test assets multiple hypothesis testing market microstructure liquidity uh, high frequency trading tick size bond cds bond spreads collateral margin requirements bond liquidity predictability right equity minimum lot of machine learning in this uh, uh, area about predictability behavioral finance social finance right media textual analysis google twitter facial recognition tonal recognition macro finance long run risk tail risk sovereign deficits defaults debt crisis financial crisis euro crisis now we have the covid crisis economic policy and uncertainty brexit us elections us political gridlock mortgages and mortgage backed security supply versus demand what what caused this uh, the financial crisis corporate finance lot of it is about identification right the standard stuff venture capital p ipos capital structure dividend policy governance and of course uh, banking is always important systemic risk capital requirements negative interest rates new topics uh, esg diversity climate change gun laws opioid crisis i used to have a professor at uh, ucla who, who worked on 20 25 years ago on uh, gun laws uh, gun control very interesting stuff big picture questions role of government trade flows economic development r and d innovation impact of covid support programs right these Uh, these topics are going to be very very interesting i saw a recent paper by raj chetty on covid support programs very interesting paper there have been a lot of papers on covid but i found this one particularly interesting okay uh, there i'm i'm done thank you terry i think i'll went a little over time that's quite all right uh, taran um there is a uh, considerable discretion you know, given by this moderator so um i look i i i think you what you've said is just so so comprehensive one of the things that really um i think i've noticed over my long working life in academia is just how much competition has increased um just how much harder it is now to get a job to get a publication in some senses it's easier because we've got much better databases that we can work with but when databases become available they become available widely which means that lots of people get access to them and start to do research but thank you very much for that Taran um I'm now going to um move to Rob Robert Faf um and uh give a brief introduction for Robert um Robert is one of Australia's leading finance academics uh, and he's an old mate of mine. Um we've been 
going to conferences together for many, many years. Um, Robert has published more than 340 papers um, in his academic career and 40 of them in A-star journals. Now, somewhat surprisingly, none of them are co-authored with me. But I'm not worried about that because I've got a claim to fame with Robert that is much more important than writing a paper together. And that is that he and I have sung together in a karaoke bar somewhere in Southeast Asia. I think it started his uh, singing career because when Robert was married um, several years ago, he managed to give a rendition of Satchmo um, at, uh, as part of his welcome address for the guests at his wedding. Um, for the last several years, Robert has been um, interested in, in helping young researchers develop their research programs through a, a pitching um, template that he's developed. And he spent a lot of time going around the world talking about that pitching template. And I thought, that he might um, at least say something about that in his comments. But the most important thing I think about um, Robert's expertise for this session is A, his breadth of experience, but B, that he is currently managing editor of a very well-respected journal, uh, PBFJ, and he, ha he has been past um, managing editor of accounting and finance. Um, he's also been an associate editor for many, many um, journals. So, Robert, I'm going to pass to you and ask you to uh, talk to five, five or ten minutes um, with a fairly unconstrained agenda. Rob, you need to unmute. All right, thank you. Uh, you can hear me. Can you see my slides, Terry? We can do both. Uh, perfect. Uh, very kind words. Um, uh, probably the greatest talent I've got is uh, trying to sing, not very well. Um, but I do enjoy my work and uh, I, I'm very energized these days. Look, you, you'll probably have to call me Mary uh, after this because I'm going to have, there's going to be a, contra a contrary, Mary, Mary quite contrary uh, sort of theme to this in part. Um, but I thought what I would do is, jeez, ah, I thought what I would do was talk about, a little bit about COVID first, uh, and I'll try not to go over time period. And if you think I've, I've gone too, for, for too long, please just cut me off and I'll stop. Um, so uh, a temptation might be to think that uh, we've, we've lived through COVID and we haven't got out the other end yet. Uh, maybe this is a ticket to getting uh, a fantastic publication in a good journal. And, um, you know, and maybe it is, but, you know, I, I suppose there's a cautionary tale here. There's, plenty, there's lots of special issues. There's a huge variety of topics that are already being covered. And, and uh, it's easy to see some big names in big journals attached to these. So you, you could be tempted to think, ah, here's, here's, a, here's a, a path to success. Uh, but there's a but. So, uh, there, there are things to be aware of. I mean, it, as you just said, Terry, uh, it, it's so competitive now and, and, and in the COVID space, it's very competitive in terms of getting papers in, into journals and into very good journals. Uh, COVID is not over yet. Uh, so, so for some topics and maybe quite a few, it's a bit, it's a bit premature, but we, we have seen papers already published uh, it's a global phenomenon and, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we look at where we forget the, uh, that something's global and we come up with, uh, you know, an angle or, a, you know, some sort of message uh, that it's some local, uh, you know, reason for, for viewing something. So we have to take that into account. We've had major crises before, GFC and, you know, what... Uh, uh, there's quite a few of them uh, that people have looked at. Now, COVID's a bit different. It's got the, the health angle to it as well. But you need to ask, does the health angle really give us a unique uh, insight that, say, the GSC wouldn't? Um, how critical is COVID to the story? Uh, you know, uh, it, it's easy to sort of think I could have a paper on sort of COVID, 
and and COVID's uh, and, and sell it as a COVID thing, and and actually COVID's not not that important really. And then do you wait or rush and uh, and time and opportunity cost around any topic, uh, of course, not just COVID. So so I sort of using this as a bit of a case study. Actually, you could you could extrapolate this to to some hot topic, other hot topics that that you're sort of looking at. You know, this is an incomplete list, and you know, there's there's hundreds of COVID papers. Um, so I'm not going to just go, you know, pick out pick on any of those. I've got a safe haven paper, um, and uh, you know, we'll probably struggle to get sadly to struggle to get that published or or in a, a super good journal. So uh, it, it's tough. All right, let me give you some general advice, and and I will circle back to what Terry indicated but Pete, you know many of you would have uh, you know probably a bit sick of me talking about the pitching research framework so I'll, I'll mention it but I don't want to dwell on it um, you know in terms of that framework uh, it just picks out all the basics uh, and, and it seems to me uh, for goodness sakes get the basics covered I mean don't have a dumb working you know uh, title of your paper I don't be too cute and don't have a title that goes on and on and on forever you know make clear your research question identify what your key papers are so that you're signaling to the the reader and the reviewer where you're really anchoring your study and the motivation and positioning it in terms of the what and the how I mean it's pretty critical to to nail clearly your idea your data and your tools and then you've got a say and usually the, a lot of these things happen in the uh, introduction and uh you know we want to be we want to know pretty quickly what's new and novel uh but just as importantly why does it matter and then this just sort of really comes down to the contribution so so that would be my general advice but this is where i i get a bit contrary and this is i think uh it's not uh, unrelated to the pitching framework but you know, to me, this is 21st century. The problem is, so responsible science, the problem is with this, it, it goes, there's, there's a, a tension, a real tension around getting published in, in uh, super quality uh, journals or any, any journals because we've got a whole lot of incentives and a 19th century thinking. So I'm going to, I'm being very controversial here. I'm I'm going to throw down the gauntlet to all the journal editors and say there is something wrong. Uh, we want credible research. We want reliable research. We want. We probably need to have more relevant research and and useful research. And hey, what about independence? The the, the independence of the research. So these three key pillars for me are the. It, this is the beacon of the future. But gee, there's scary stuff here, and it will make publishing much more difficult now if you take too much of what i'm saying here on board your 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 chance of getting into the journal of finance which was close to zero will be absolutely zero so you need to sort of uh make that that adjustment now um what i would say is over time try and have some of your research where you're trying to create knowledge that is credible and reliable as opposed to something that may be less credible or unreliable. Uh, we don't want to pump out noise, uh, you know, and probably too many of my papers are noise. Um, why do we want this? Well, you know, uh, there, there are plenty of incentives there that, that I think lead us down a dark, uh, dark passage. And, and I think it's time to try and kick that that habit. We need to have research that's more useful and relevant. So the sorts of things I'm predicting are going to take place, and I, I'm happy to lead the charge with Pacific Basin Finance Journal. I'm really pleased Elsevier are behind me. So uh, I've had an experiment in the pre-registered report uh, space. Uh, there, there's no silver bullets here. You can criticize any of this, but I think we've got to head in this direction. And what we do with pre-registration is try and take off the table people's concern about significant results. Now, high quality research is absolutely paramount. So we've got to have an assessment of, uh, you, you know, you're doing, uh, your design is, is, is uh, at the forefront. It's, it's a uh, gold standard. And uh, then the results are the results. And if it's not significant, that is something we need to know. We don't want you to p-hack. All right, Torin 
has got a fantastic paper on p-hacking, and there's also harking, hypothesizing after the results are known. Too many of my papers are a bit like that, and I'm not particularly proud of it, I must admit, and, and we've got to shake that off. Now, Mary Mary, quite contrary, is that's not going to get you into tier one journals or high quality journals, the way we're sitting now. So one of my goals is, and I'm probably going to spectacularly fail before I retire. I'm going to try and bring along a journal editors at least a little bit with me. Journal editors are stakeholders in the, the process and they have to take a few risks and, you know, publish replication. Now, I take what Torin said earlier and, and the way we think is that replication studies are not going to make it in top tier journals but we need to publish them, okay? We give them a different label and we say, this is a replication study. We shouldn't look down on that, down our noses and say, that's, you know, it, it's not worth doing. These are absolutely worth doing and we have to recognize that and we have to publish them. That's not gonna get you in the top tier journals, but I would really urge people to embrace some of this as we go forward you can't take it all on, that uh, you, you have a portfolio of, of research and, and you join what I believe is a really, really important uh, task for us, and that is to be responsible scientists. So that's quite controversial. I'm going to stop there. Um, this is my uh, goal for uh, from now, for the many years I've still got left, uh, I'm, I'm going to continue to bang this drum and uh, I don't care if you're laughing at me. I believe this. I could be wrong. I could spectacularly fail. So be it. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thanks very much, Robert. Um, and yes, keep banging the drum um, and maybe even singing at the same time. Because yep. um, you've got quite a chorus, um, I think. I've already started to see some questions coming through um, in, uh, in Slido that directly address some of the points that you've just made, Robert, so we'll come back to those. Um, but it's now um, um, to turn to John Karpov, um, who is our next speaker. John also has been extensively introduced um, when he gave his keynote address at the conference, so I don't want to reiterate all of the, the very nice things that were said about him, but just perhaps to reiterate that he is a very, very highly regarded um, empirical and theoretical researcher with a huge range of, of interesting papers that have, um, that have been written, and many of them have, have won uh, quite prestigious research awards. Um, <laughs> So um, the, the, the issues that are perhaps most relevant in relation to John for this session um, are his direct involvement in, uh, in academic journals. He's uh, an associate editor of the Journal of Finance, an associate editor of the Journal of Financial Economics, and an associate editor of JFQA. Um, he's also previously been an advisory editor for financial management, and he was previously managing editor of JFQA. So a very, very well credentialed researcher with a huge number of very outstanding publications. And I'm sure that um, what John will have to say to us will help many of you in this daunting process of seeking publication in the top tier journals. So I'll pass to you, John. Terry, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I'm sharing the wrong thing, so let me stop sharing here. And you can see the project I was working on right there. Okay, here we go. Oh, no, it doesn't want to share this. Hmm. Well, I have a couple slides I'd like to show you. I'm struggling with how to uh collect this one file that i do want to share with you 
Here we go. And um, hopefully you can see this. First, Terry, thanks a lot for that great introduction. Uh, sorry yes, for my and we can right see there. we can see your slides, John. Great, thanks. And uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of what I have to say uh, just will follow on the coattails of Tarun and uh, Bob. Uh, I don't think your comments are that controversial, Bob. So, uh, so, 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 Robert, we'll we'll see. I also have, uh, I'm calling this referees, editors, and other despots. I'm, I'm uh, the, tailored some slides around some questions that Terry had asked um, us to talk about, about the process of reviewing papers at these journals. A lot of these comments strike me as somewhat generic. I think you might have more specific questions, which I hope come up in Q and A. And I think the specific questions or where the rubber meets the road and where we have some really difficult issues to consider. But to hopefully set things up a little bit, I'd like to repeat something that Tarun said, which is research is really hard. I mean, we are literally trying to push out the frontier of knowledge. That's a hard thing to do. We're literally doing something that is uh, captured in our models as an increase in technological know-how. Our various macro models, for example, technology, is an important factor of production that drives productivity, growth, and well-being. That's what we are involved in trying to do, is expand the frontier of knowledge. And uh, uh, I got my line, research is hard, from uh, Steve Carroll, uh, who, as General Mark Merritt on Space Force, if you haven't said this, famously says, space is hard. Well, that's sort of our motto, too. Uh, Somerset Mon pointed this out when it came to writing in general. He says there are three, three rules for writing a novel. That's a promising start. Uh, unfortunately, no one knows what they are. There is no formula, in other words. Having said that, I will try to talk about the process that journals go through. So journals uh, evolved now, what, four or five centuries ago as uh, vehicles to do a combination of things in the research world, that is to incentivize and help to develop research and research ideas, to vet research, and then also to help disseminate research. And that's the role that our journals play, those various components from incentivizing, developing, uh, vetting, and then disseminating. And in several journals, um, such as the Journal of Finance, RFS, Management Science, they, they follow a process that looks a lot like this chart. You have your paper and you submit it, and it goes into the editor, and the editor first has to decide, are we gonna desk reject this thing? If so, you very quickly hear back from the journal and it's not good news. More frequently, the editor will send the paper to an associate editor to consider, and the associate editor then says, well, do I want to recommend desk reject? If so, then probably it will be desk rejected at that level. Again, more frequently, the, the associate editor recommends or at some journals such as Management Science actually assigns reviewers and the paper is sent to reviewers. At the journals that I'm mentioning here, it's common to have say two reviewers, at least uh, uh, two, that, that even includes Management Science, which for other departments will have three reviewers. The reviews come back in, the, the associate editor tries to distill what the reviewers are saying, makes a recommendation to the editor, and the editor makes the final decision. And then you receive the outcome of that re decision, either reject or R&R &R or an accept. So that's a stylized version of the process. Now, there are other journals that have a simple, simplified version of this, the JFE and JFQA are examples, in which uh, there are not multiple layers uh, in, in, in the decision process. Rather, the editor will send the paper directly to a reviewer. In these two journals' cases, typically it's a single reviewer. And the role that associate editors play at these journals is primarily as frequent reviewers, and then less commonly as uh, tiebreakers or uh, guest editors for papers where the lead editor would have a conflict of interest. The, the editor receives the reviews back and makes a decision and you get the reject, revise and resubmit or accept response in that case. Well, those are the general processes, but as you as a, as a researcher, 
as you can see in those previous diagrams, you get to see some of the decision process. What you see is the referee report typically and the editor's letter back to you as the author. But there's a lot of important stuff that we don't see as authors, and that is the referee's letter, letter to the editor, which will overlap with, but not be subsumed by the referee report, which you see, and the editor's own deliberations, which can be uh, independent, uh, could involve talking to other, other editors, uh, could involve some back and forth with the referee or an associate editor. So what happens? I think it's worth thinking about what you don't see as well as what you do see and helping to think through this process and how you can best position your papers in the process. So there are various scenarios. One is the standard rejection. Here, what you see is the referee offering suggestions and you see a rejection letter from the editor. What you don't see is the referee's recommendation, which frequently will be to reject, and the editor with a standard rejection will say, you know, this is a, a relatively easy call. Uh, and you get a rejection letter that frequently will have a form letter aspect to it. Although I should say there is a time trend across all journals for editors to spend more and more time thinking about letters, uh, letters, even rejection letters, and trying to spend time and respect your paper appropriately. A common reason for a relatively standard reject is, is that in the view of the editorial team, the paper is fatally flawed. Here's an example. Uh, so I, I try to uh, make anonymous some, some excerpts from uh, reviews or back and forth, and here are just a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is the standard reject. Um, in the letter to the editor, the referee wrote, I think the idea of a covariance ratio is moderately interesting. However, there are two major problems with this paper. First, the paper suffers from the lack of a clear alternative hypothesis to the null. And second, the paper misses what seems the most obvious interpretation of the result. Now, to most readers, those are pretty strong criticisms. Those are each you know, fatal flaws or can be considered fatal flaws in most instances. So you as a, as a, as a, as a paper author, may not see in such stark terms this language that is being communicated to the editor. Hopefully the review will contain enough information where you get a clear reason for why the reviewer has come to their decision or recommendation, but, but there's clearly even more stark language going on uh, behind the scenes. Oops, sorry. Here's a second scenario. This is a close call rejection. Here again, you see a referee report, you see a rejection letter. Sometimes it's more detailed because the editor in such cases has spent more time thinking about your case. The referee may be lukewarm or may recommend or r, &R. There may be a split uh, set of recommendations if there's more than one referee. And uh, an example of, of this, uh, would be a, 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 a rejection where the editor spent some time thinking about your paper but decides not to pursue it any further. And why might the editor not, to, not choose to pursue the paper more? Well, ultimately, it's because the expected costs are better than the, or higher than the expected benefits. And here are some possible reasons. The paper's too rough, and, and the editor's opinion is going to require so too much investment uh, from the editorial team with an uncertain outcome. There could be flawed or incomplete economic reasoning, poor motivation, gaps in the theoretical or empirical work, or frequently it's a contribution uh, judgment. Now clearly these are judgments being made by the editorial team, but it is the editorial respons team's responsibility to make these judgments. Is this a significant enough question is it a large enough question that appeals to a, a broad enough part of the of the profession? It doesn't make new uh, break new ground given what's come before. Um, and ultimately, a reject will come down to a, a lack of confidence that the author will be able to execute the revision enough, competent, competently or aggressively enough to be able to get over that bar. Again, thinking about the numbers that Tarun presented. 
the editorial team is faced with a constraint in journal space and a large number of papers competing for that space. So it's a harsh, harsh process at this point. Here's an example of a close call. The referee says in the report, I like how this paper demonstrates managerial opportunism in a very interesting setting using more appropriate econometric techniques than have been used previously. So that's a very positive and encouraging comment. However, in the letter to the editor, the referee wrote, this paper has considerable potential. The major problem is that it does, does not have much bang for the buck. In other words, the contribution is relatively small. Do we really need another paper showing that managerial opportunism exists? So you can see that there's a more guarded um, recommendation to the editor, uh, considering that contribution may be a problem. Here's an example or, of, of a, another po common scenario. This is the one that you want to get, and that is where the referee recommends an R&R &R and the editor says, I'm persuaded. Sometimes the referee may be more on the fence and the editor is persuaded nonetheless. And I have a few observations and, and suggestions at this point is when you have received feedback like this, it's your job then to revise the paper appropriately to be able to meet the concerns of the editorial team. And to do so, I suggest the reading, listening, and working. So reading, you gotta read between the lines. A lot's going on behind uh, the referee's report, a lot of thinking. So to try to figure out what that is, listen, at least figuratively listen as you read, as well as you can to figure out what the referee really means. And I think there's a basic problem here, and that is that it is costly for the referee to figure out not only what your paper is about, but to figure out what the referee thinks about your paper. And, and referees are time constrained themselves, and they may write a, write a paragraph that is confusing, not because they mean to be confusing and not because they mean to be jerks, but because it's just really costly to figure out exactly what it is that they are concerned about or what suggestion they have or how to make the paper better. And so referees are not going to maximize the amount of time they spend to improve your paper. They're doing a cost benefit uh, calculation in the background themselves and may end up providing feedback to you that is not as perfect and clear as you would wish. Because of this, in your revision, you've got to work uh, that you're really on top of it, that you, you can't simply take the literal comments of the, of the review. You've got to go beyond that. You've got to read into the comments to figure out what's behind them. What is the referee pushing for? Um, and you've got to push your own paper forward continually, even, if, even addressing issues that may not have come, been brought up by the referee. Here's an example of our R&R &R letter. Uh, there's usually qualifying language such as this. I should warn you that while the referee likes your topic, the referee is skeptical about whether a revision will be a major improvement. And you can see that in this case, the author did a very successful job of aggressively addressing these concerns. And the referee wrote back and said, I commend the author on her refinement of this certain variable for which she appears to have undertaken a large amount of data collection. The author has also implemented a satisfactory method of dealing with the endogeneity of the selection process. So, so this is an example in which the, the editorial team was brought onto the side of the author through the author's hard work and diligence in being aggressive about addressing previous concerns. A couple of comments, um, just background, again, big picture thoughts. I really like Deidre McCloskey's writing in general, but including her writing on on writing. Uh, her book on the rhetoric of economics is something I strongly recommend. And maybe one way of thinking about this is writing is thinking. It's a way of figuring out what you're doing. Uh, Daniel Bornstein, former Librarian of Congress said it this way, I write to discover what I think. After all, the bars aren't open that early when he normally writes. Other things that help, I think, again, this is a, 30,000 foot level, but I offer it nonetheless uh, in this hard process is really working hard to be genuine about what your contribution is, what you did, trying to consider all sides to your narrative. I mean, we so frequently end up 
be boxing ourselves into a corner by taking a stand and wanting to have a certain narrative. Really give yourself the freedom to not be boxed into a, a particular narrative. Um, how would a critic view your argument? Uh, like uh, uh, others have already said, uh, you wanna work to write well. I have my own personal favorite authors whose writing I think just sing. Uh, Anne Lamont, Toni Morrison, Norman McLean, for example. Um, again, this is very you know English and American centric, but that, those are authors that have worked for me or in our field, Jeremy Stein, Stu Myers, Michelle Lowry, Wayne Pearson, you know, the read writers who, re who write well and try to figure that out. And I want to acknowledge that for people for whom English is a second language, this is going to be, you know, especially a challenge, something uh, that I just have utmost admiration for those tackling. Because um, I know that when I try to, uh, you know, my, my attempt at a second language is Spanish. My my Spanish just sucks, and an attempt to write a research paper in it, uh, I would be I would be hopeless. Finally, as Truman pointed out, you're going to be living with your project a long time, so choose stuff that you really like. Um, uh, you don't want to be a couple of years into this and be sick of it already. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. That that was great and expected I expected it would be um, lots and lots of um, very very strong and sound advice for aspiring publishers when, when I um, I look at the top journals um, and I read the first footnote of many of the papers that are published in the top journals one of the things that I notice is the number of workshops that the research has been exposed to and the number of acknowledgements um, that have, have um, been attributed to the paper. Quite frequently, the people who are cited in the first footnote are the who's who of the research area. So I think an attribute of, or an important attribute of getting papers into the top journals is to make sure that you understand the background literature very well that you've identified a problem that is not yet resolved in the background literature, that you know the contributions of people who've, um, who've written previously in that work, that you've sought their opinions and feedback on what you're doing, that you've exposed your ideas as widely as possible. So that's a, a sort of a reflection that I get of, of looking at the first footnote of many of the papers in the very top journals. But having said that, um, let me now turn to our final speaker, Tom Smith. Tom, you've gone black and white, but that's quite all right. Um, Tom Smith is also one of Australia's leading academics. In fact, to call him an Australian academic is probably a little bit uh, misleading because much of his career was also in the US. Um, Tom, is again like Robert, an old mate of mine. We've walked along beaches um, many, many times early in the morning, despite the hangovers that we've had from the previous night's um, endeavors. Irrespective of how late the previous night was, Tom is always available at 6 a.m. for a walk along a beach and a swim. Uh, and some of the, my fondest reflections of academic life have been those walks that I've had with Tom and, and a few other hardy souls. Um, Tom's research work has been uh, widely published in the very top journals. And this evening, in fact, as you all know, um, we're going to give special recognition to the outstanding contribution that Tom has made to finance literature um, among Australian academics. Um, Tom is a uh, previous journal editor of uh, accounting and finance and one of the things that was very obvious during his editorial process was that the number of papers that were submitted greatly increased. Um, Tom's also very passionate and very proud of his PhD research students and the fact that many of them, more than 50 of them, have managed to publish in top tier journals. So with that background, um, I invite you, Tom, to 
give your reflections on this daunting process of getting your work into the top tier journals. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Terry, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Bala. Um, I think Bala is uh, a huge unsung hero uh, in the field, um, in Australia and internationally, and he deserves great recognition for the, what, all of his contributions to academia, um, not least of which is this, this conference. And um, thank you, Bala. So uh, what I'm gonna do is a little different but uh, look, uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to focus on what the editors are looking for, but I'm going to try to summarize what the other speakers have told you um, up to now. And essentially what they're saying is you should workshop your paper, you know, either with the top people in the field and, and or conferences. You should polish your paper. You know? and you should revise and update your paper, right? It's not just good enough to do a draft and send it to the journal. So the summary is workshop, 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 polish, 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 revise, revise, revise. And you're going to have to update the data uh, as you do this, right? Because all of those things uh, take time. What I principally do in my academic career is teach people how to do research. That's my vocation. This uh, Dropbox link, uh, takes you to the national PhD course that Martina Lin and Lipper and I are run on all the different research methodologies. So you'll see them all there. And what you'll see is the state of the art, what editors are looking for, uh, you know, a really good exemplar and where to from here. So uh, Bala will make these slides available so you can go to that course. I'm going to talk about First of all, you've got to engage, for the top journals, you've got to engage in the, the research conversation at JFB, RFS, uh, yeah, and Federal um, Finance. So, but you've also got to do it in the local journals in the Pacific Basin. And I'm saying that particularly because we've seen the rise of AAAJ to be an A star in the rankings here. Very soon, uh, that's going to be true for Robert's Journal, the Pacific Basin Finance Journal and uh, for Stewart's journal, Advocates, right? And Accounting and Finance under the, the Gary Munro's great editorship, editorship has a chance too. So what, what uh, as an editor, what I noticed was people would refer to, say, an original study uh, in the top journal. For example, Jensen and Meckling in 1976 write about principal agents. And then they would, um, you know, cite maybe one more uh, article in the, the JF or JFP or RFS, and then their study. So as an editor in the Pacific Basin, I'm not going to send it to Jensen Meckling and those people. I'm going to send the journal to uh, a Australian, um, Chinese, a New Zealand academic that works in the field and might have 10 papers in the principal Asian field. Well, they're not going to appreciate getting a paper where you completely ignored their work. Right? And so for those uh, sorts of papers, I had a desk, uh, a desk reject, but it was a reject and resubmit. Yeah? The paper, most of the time, papers are too long. And if it doesn't engage in the conversation, then um, you, know, you really should go back and look, you know, look at who are the researchers in that area, right? So a lot of people got this, uh, reject and resubmit uh, letter. What are the authors looking for? Uh, what are the editors looking for in qualitative research? Yeah. And uh, Kaczynski and Samolo uh, point out some of the key co con concerns they're looking for. One, that authors should be clear on their theoretical perspective and their research question. Uh, two, the interview question should be tied to the research question. Uh, the triangulation between interviews, observations, and documents is vital. You should show the iteration from your initial themes to your intermediate themes to your final themes. Your conclusion should be tied explicitly to the source. Was it the interview? Was it the observation? Was it the documentation, documentation you saw at the firm website? Was it from memos or personal uh, diaries? And the best, pr best practice of write-up given by, actually by the editors themselves. 
and Bari, uh, is an editor, and Gepa, editor, is telling you how to do this. Right? And I've just got some uh, the, the local people that are, the, that are experts in that. The survey research, the key things that editors are looking for is getting the questions right, the use of scales uh, and response bias, and uh, the really big hot topic at the moment is common method variance. So you have to be able, you have to address that. Yeah, and there's a there's a really good paper that gives you an introduction. Donald Clare is great for scales, um, and Chang and Podstock is the is the paper about common method variance. For literature reviews, this is the field that's changed the most. The state of the art now is that it has to be scientific and systematic. This comes from the work of Eugene Garfield, who was a librarian. He came up with the impact factors for journals. He's the one that, you know, that tells us that we that nature and science are the top two journals. We didn't actually know that before. They have impact factors of 50 or more. Um, and uh, you know, the whole uh, citation network uh, comes from the work of Eugene Garfield. So, so when Google was looking for a search engine, they used his uh, network mapping uh, uh, algorithm. Right? So the whole Google search is based on the work of Eugene uh, Garfield. So, what are you got to do, right? Uh, in this, what are the editors looking for? Well, you've got to establish the, the scope. You've got to do a systematic keyword search of, say, the Web of Science or Scopus. You know, get all the articles. Uh, you typically draw a network map of the literature using either Garfield's HisSight program or the shiny version of Bibliometrics in R. Uh, editors are particularly uh, uh, they want to see that you have got data cleaning. You know, you fill more. Researchers uh, triangulate on the final list of papers that you check cited reference, make sure that important papers are not missed. Uh, and here you see there's a bunch of um, um, original work of Garfield and how to do uh, literature review there, um, Sarah and Renamuka. Experiments, uh, the issues that uh, editors are looking at, uh, use of students versus professionals, uh, do, the, you know, do the results convey to the real world, uh, the anchoring bias yeah, and order effect bias are very important. And there's some good uh, references there that Bella will make available with his notes. And finally, as we saw yesterday, uh, you know, the, the capital market studies, it's uh, endogeneity, endogeneity, endogeneity. We talked about system GMM as just the basic, but then if you could do a natural experiment, that's even better. Yeah. And the more exogenous shocks you could get the better. And my talk yesterday, I only had one. Right? But of course, the, the, one I, the one I really loved was the high input, where they had hundreds. There's also issues around sample selection. All of our statistics are based on a random sample, yet we go out and do a sample, you know, we do a study of pegos. Well, there's a huge sample selection uh, that we have to take into account. And then, of course, the robustness of the standard error in the use of GMM bootstrap. These are the issues um, that editors tell us that they're looking at. And so um, it's probably a good idea uh, to take notice. And that's it. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, it, was, it was good that you expanded um, uh, your discussion into some of the less um, well-recognized areas of research, qualitative research, survey work, all those, those sorts of things, and gave um, some advice to our, uh, our audience in those areas. So um, we're now at a point where we need to um, address the various questions that have cropped up. And... Um, Oh, somebody's done that for me. Um, so the screen. Uh, wonderful been... Erica. The wonderful Erica has done that. She's amazing. I, I want to steal learning... from Bella. I've got too much respect for him. I spent hours learning how to share my screen, and, and it's all been done for me. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how we, we should handle these questions because I'm sure all four of you would have um, advice on each of the questions that have popped up. But maybe um, if we just go through one by one, um, and I'll ask Taryn to first talk about 
the, the first question there, any advice on writing covering letters that accompany the submission? Um, Taryn, you'll need to unmute. Yeah. Oh. I did, yeah. So yeah, cover letters are important. That's the one time you can tell the editor why this paper should be published. So spend time thinking about it, uh, talk about your paper, why it's important and what's new. Let the editor look at it, but I would not suggest referees. Uh, I, I don't think we would look at anything in the cover letter telling us, oh, we like this referee, that, that's a red flag right there. Can I jump in, Terry? Sure. Uh, Mary, Mary, quite contrary. My advice <laughs> is uh, don't write them, but you know, some editors might feel offended. Um, this is probably a sad reflection on me. I almost never look at a cover letter. Uh, could, I, I couldn't think of a, you know, in most cases, a, a bigger waste of my time. Um, so what, what would then be my, you know, so that's not very helpful. Your abstract is where I would go to first. So, uh, and we've had advice on how important it is to, to shape up things like that. You want to hook the reader, you hook them in, well, you, there's three obvious places, the title, the abstract and the introduction. Um, so view that as, you know, my advice would be, and you know, people will disagree, don't waste your time on a cover letter, put that time, invest that time in the front end of your paper and uh, an editor like me, if there's any of the, them around, that's where they're gonna get the information. Um, anyone else? Uh, look, I love I love the getting the cover letter. Um, it really conveys a lot of information to me, and I love uh, writing uh, cover letters for Bill Shaw. Uh, I really do. Uh, I've enjoyed it over the years, and you get like a healthy uh, communication uh, going with the editor. So I can get, I really, really particularly like uh, the cover letter. So with the greatest of respect to Robert, so he, he, oh. if they, if you can give Robert a cover letter, he can just choose not to read. <laughs> So, I think it just, is good. a lot of editors uh, like to see that, especially when you've got so many submissions. It's good to see a couple of uh, Just to uh, you know, split on this completely, um, uh, I, I agree with Robert, basically. Uh, in fact, the Journal of Finance actually discourages you from submitting a cover letter. Um, now, there are exceptions. Um, the you know, exception is in the next question. Uh, there may be situations where you want to convey some important information to the editor. Uh, and, and an example could be, as indicated in that question, uh, you know, that there's a competing paper out there and, and uh, you just want to give the, letter, the editor a heads up that you think that uh, you would get a fairer shake if the reviewer was not an author of that competing paper. I think that's a reasonable reason to write or spend time on a cover letter. I should say my typical cover letter is basically, um, you know, a sentence or two long, you know, uh, attached is my paper. Um, uh, thank you for considering it. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, the next question that's popped up is um, about bias um, in the publication process. Um, I'm not quite sure what bias the questioner has in mind, but um, one issue that you could perhaps talk about in terms of bias is a well-known um, bias towards not publishing results that are seen to be statistically significant and, and the implications of that particular bias. Uh, can I chip in? I mean, this is right down my alley, and I won't. I just don't. Uh, I, I hope I don't take too much time. I'll, I'll promise. Um, so, so I think that's uh, you know, to me, uh, if there's a, if there's crisis happening in in research in all fields, then this is one of the places to to sort of look. So, you know, how many times have you read uh, a paper in the top three journals and? thought to yourself, that's a really super interesting question. It's been done really well and they didn't find anything. Uh, I can't remember it now. Maybe I just haven't looked hard enough. So in what, what, uh, what version of the universe of the world would you think that, uh, or, uh, that a journal is going to, so, so that 
if you're trying to find out how the world works, you're only going to see um, sort of the, these uh, significant results, as you say, Terry. And we don't see negative, you know, it's really hard. Once there's an established uh, sort of paper, it's hard to come in and, and try and knock it off. Uh, you know, maybe the big guns can do that. So, you know, I, there's a, to me, there's got to be a positive bias uh, there. And uh, we've got to be very careful how we, how we read the literature. And this is part of where things are heading in the future. I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of it. And I'll probably be spectacularly wrong. But that's my, that's my two cents. No, I, I agree with Robert on this. Uh, only significant results get published, unfortunately. Cam Harvey talked about this in his presidential address. If you look at the first graph he put up, the insignificant results just don't get published because they don't have an impact. Um, and the questions then arise, is it due to lack of power? Is it due to lack of uh, good data? W what's causing these insignificant results, right? So I totally agree with you. In terms of bias, yeah, there's a bias. If you don't go to conferences, if you don't present your paper, it's hard for uh, people to be aware of what you're doing, right? It's, it's important to go to conferences. It's important to go to uh, seminars, to talk to people. So Jeff, <laughs> and I agree. I agree with everybody's comments. Um, the way I read this question there, uh, the question really does, what I hear anyways, is not so much a bias uh, toward publishing significant results, but sort of a, a inner circle bias that the editors of top journals publish the papers of people who are their friends. There's a concern about that. And, and I want to acknowledge that there is a strong perception, I believe, of such things happening. And some journals at certain places have that perception more than other journals, but then at other places, you know, other journals, you know, so there's a lot of sort of sniping kind of uh, uh, attitudes that can be expressed. I think it's also important to acknowledge that it is easier, I think, for the editorial team to uh, send a reject letter to an author team who they don't know. I think that's just human nature. Um, having said that, I think the nature of the inner circle is much less of a thing than what the questioner might think um, you would be surprised, for example, uh, if you were to look. So uh, I don't think it's revealing anything uh, inappropriate to say that uh, as an associate editor at a journal such as the Journal of Finance, in the process of identifying people who might be reasonable reviewers for a paper, you access information which includes papers that that person has had rejected as well as accepted as the journal. And you'd, you might be surprised at how the most well-established famous people in the field have lots and lots of rejected papers. Um, it's, just, it's just a fact of life, an unfortunate fact of life. Um, uh, maybe one way of turning this question a little bit would be, you wanna work as, an, as a researcher to become part of the inner circle. And by inner circle, I don't mean anything nefarious here or inappropriate. I mean, to be part of the contributing group of people to the, to the knowledge in our field. And you do that, I think, as Tarun was saying, by interacting as much as you can with others, trying to uh, uh, do good research. There's, you know, it all comes down to really trying to do good research. Uh, and then, you know, then you will be, uh, I think, uh, at least recognized and known and sought for for your advice. So, yeah, a couple of couple points. One is there's an endogeneity issue here, right? The editors want well-written and interesting papers that are cyclable. And it just turns out, uh, and we're just having a discussion, right, with people that have published in tier ones over you know, five or six decades. Just so happens there's a number of people out there that do really interesting and relevant and cyclable research, and they get published. So it's not, you know, it's not that being in the inner circle of the business is that they actually write interesting and relevant papers and cyclical papers. Second thing is, uh, is there a bias? Well, there's been research on this, right? Actually published in top journals. 
And the research looked at <clears throat> if um, an editor got appointed from a university, did the colleagues at the university uh, publish more in the journal than, than before? And the answer was yes, right? And you think, oh my God, that's an evidence of a bias. But the study went, then went on to, to, to show that those publications got far more citations than uh, the ones from uh, you know, un unconnected colleagues. So the story that the paper came up with was, well, they knew the person, right? Uh, and that person was at their school, you know, and so they sent the paper to them rather than to you know, the, the other competing journals, I guess, right? Thinking you know, that maybe you know, that they'd have an advantage, but they were actually really good, you know, again, and not native or they were interesting, and well-written papers. Uh, so uh, I'll take that reference out and uh, I'll share, share with you. Another uh, of the, uh, the issues that arises in this, in this context of, um, of significant um, results is one of my pet hates, and that is the issue of robustness tests. How many of you have ever seen um, robustness tests written up in papers where the results weren't robust. If they aren't robust, they just don't get reported. Um, and that's another aspect of, of bias in, in this whole process. I think we have to be able to encourage people to do appropriate robustness tests and be sufficiently mature, uh, sufficiently brave to acknowledge that um, that particular aspect of the experiment didn't work. Terry, can I chip in there, please? Um, so, so, so I totally agree with you, and uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I I can see the flaw in this sentence that I can't even get, you know, finish. But, you know, I, I just wonder if if down, you know, as we move down the track, robustness tests are really important. If we could, I guess, not so much think that we could come up with a standard set that people in certain fields have to do, because that, that's a bit prescriptive, right? And, and uh, there's so many different studies and, and, and it wouldn't be possible. But, you know, uh, uh, we, we've got a sufficiently mature discipline and in, at least in certain mature areas, there is uh, a standard set, you know, there's almost a standard set or at least some strong guidelines that that those leaders in the field could just sit down and say, all right, we, this is not prescriptive, but if you're going to do a paper in, on, you know, in capital structure, whatever, here are the things you've got to do. And we just lay it out and it's there at the beginning uh, 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 for, for anyone that when they're going down the path, they know I've got to do those. If I don't do them and I do them in a way that doesn't look like I fiddled fiddle the books, um, then no one's going to believe me. But, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a dumb suggestion. I get that. But I just wonder, can we go down that path a little bit? Yeah, dumb. Okay, problem. so um, <laughs> another of the, uh, <clears throat> the issues in relation to bias is this issue of, of getting results published in the top US journals where <clears throat> the data sets come from non-US sources. Um, whether or not any of you would like to comment on that. Um, in my own experience, I think if you can identify research you know, questions that can be, that can't be answered using US data but can be answered using international data, um, then that's a natural way to, to get over this, this issue of um, a potential bias for publishing results in the US that are based on US data. So identify the gap in the literature that exists in the international literature and find an institutional set of arrangements that allow you to investigate that gap in, a, in an in in an interesting and innovative way. Um, good research will get published in the good journals, irrespective of what data set um, is being used. So um, any other, I, I welcome 
any other thoughts that you guys have got on that issue? Uh, Eddie, you just said it just right. I totally agree with what you said. Mm. Yep. You know, there's, um, yeah, I hope this is not too far afield, but the, uh, it strikes me that there's a, there's a tension that we live with as researchers, and we also live with this tension as reviewers when you're asked to review papers, say for conferences or for journals. And, and, and the, the tension is, is uh, uh, sort of having an open mind to new ideas, or as a researcher, being open to feedback from reviewers, from commenters, from people, you know, anybody you can get feedback for, um, trying to push yourself to be open-minded about potential flaws in your paper and trying to work to address those flaws. Um, and intention with that is a certain amount of confidence you've got to have in your work. And, uh, and you know, one wonderful thing about this profession is that unlike, say, a junior person at a law firm, uh, a, a junior faculty member has complete autonomy in terms of choosing what topics on which to work. And that's a tremendous amount of freedom. And with that freedom comes this responsibility to hold that tension and, you know, and, and work with it. And that is to be really confident in what you're doing, confident enough that you're going to push your ideas and push your paper and yet still be open to new ideas. Now, how does this play out? Here, here's a personal example. Um, over the last few years, I've had four papers that I've thought that were, I thought, Really, I was excited about each one of these papers. And then I've had about an equal number of papers that I thought were sort of more standard. I still liked them, but they were sort of, I didn't feel like they were, you know, really breaking new ground or challenging things. Um, the, the, the papers I thought of it personally as less creative had relatively easy paths toward publication. The papers that I thought were particularly new and exciting or creative have had very challenging paths toward publication. Uh, in fact, one of them uh, right now is dormant and uh, so I hope to revise it, you know, revive it somehow, but you know, I really put a, years of work into this and like it a lot, but kept on getting negative feedback. At, which, at what point do I decide the negative feedback is correct? Or do I decide I've really got something here? This is, a, this is the kind of tension I think that we all as researchers have to try to embrace, um, and you've got to be both open-minded and have a lot of chutzpah and confidence in your work. So, uh, so that, I think that applies to using samples from a non-U.S. data as well as topics that you might choose. You know, you're in charge of choosing what you think is important and pushing forward. Okay, so um, the questions keep popping up. Um, but um, there's one here about how do you go about selecting the referees um, for um, papers that are submitted? So I know that's been discussed briefly, but uh, any other thoughts on, on the process of, of selecting referees? The question um, says that there is a limited supply of constructive and good referees. I'm not sure if that's an oxymoron um, because good referees can sometimes be other than constructive, but um, the process of, of assigning referees. Uh, let me chip well, in. Uh, okay. okay. Do you want to go, Tom? Uh, no, you go, Robert. Okay. Uh, you know, it's an imperfect process. Uh, you know, all, ref all, all editors have probably faced very similar situations uh, from time to time. And it, it's incredibly challenging, you know, and it, and it seems to come in waves. So, you know, you, you get a, a set of papers, uh, you know, three or four papers on a very, very similar topic within a week. And uh, so the first one of these you got, you, you managed to get your, your number one pick as a reviewer. And then a day later, and I'm exaggerating here, it doesn't almost, you know, not, not literally like this, uh, you'd wish you could ask that same person to referee it. Now, this might seem extreme that there's only one really super qualified uh, referee. Um, and I'm not saying that, although from my perspective, uh, Pacific Basin Finance Journal, I'm going to have a tough time getting the real big people to, to agree to review. 
So I've got a much smaller pool to ask uh, to, to do it. So that, you know, that scenario really puts uh, a, a big challenge to us. I mean, so, so for me, uh, and you know, anyone has been around long enough, you, you know a lot of people and you've got a bit of an idea of where you could go to uh, as long as you don't ha already have them uh, reviewing for you. So, so that's a big advantage, um, but it doesn't always work and you get a paper in an area, you think, oh my gosh. So uh, you do obvious things like have a look at the reference list um, and probably 50% of the time or maybe even higher, uh, depending on how, you know, uh, ex you know, how extensive your, your uh, list of references are, the reviewer is going to be one of the authors of the paper that you've, re you've cited. Uh, and if, you, if you're absolutely surprised by that, uh, I'm just, at, you know, I would be so stunned. Now, of course, there are issues. You might, you know, the most logical person to review is someone that could be deemed to have a big stake, a conflict of interest. And, you know, sometimes we would worry about that with certain individuals. At the end of the day, we've got to take the view. We're all professionals. We're all, uh, you know, you, you just have to say, uh, okay, that person I know is qualified because they've got a working paper in the field, but I'm going to ask them. So it, it, it's sort of, you know, pretty basic stuff. And it's, it's, the, it's the 5%. It could be the 80, the 20, uh, the Pareto uh, rule, 20% of the papers you get provide you with 80% of the headaches in all sorts of ways, including choosing referees. Okay. So, so I every, everything, every, everything that Robert said, um, but it's a little more, there's another layer, right? Uh, as an editor in chief, when you've got you know, several thousand uh, submissions, you, you have area editors, right? And you sign the paper to them, and they're likely to have, you know, as Robert, all, all of what we described applies to what the area editor goes through. They, they have a list of people they know in the area. Some are already got tougher block with you, so they go down the last list of the of the editors. Okay, um, I've just had a, a, a chat message from Bala saying, could we finish at 11.48? And I'm sure you all want to keep him happy and smiling, so um, far be it from me to um, disregard the message from on high. Look, um, apologies to people who've submitted questions that we haven't got to, um, but uh, and there are many of them there. I think most of the issues have probably been covered at least in, in a broad sense, um, though some of them are a lot more specific. I'd like to thank our four speakers um, for what I think has been an extremely interesting and, and very, very helpful set of comments and advice that they've given um, to aspiring authors. Um, your expertise, your experience is broad and the advice that you've given is extremely sound. So could I now just pass to Bala, who I think wants to wrap up the session. Um, we can't hear you, Bala. Oh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Shelley, and thanks uh, for our leading scholars uh, participating in the panel. And uh, most importantly, we need to thank, uh, because they, they are using their very, very valuable time uh, for us to actually to guiding uh, the academics or the PhD student uh, connecting with us currently from around the world. Uh, various countries so they have put uh, a lot of insight and what we need to do and uh, how we can target uh, quality journals so and also most important importantly if you are using targeting a regional journal you may be knowing that you know we will be running in the special issue uh, the, those papers presented who wanted to publish at accounting and finance or Pacific Basin so the Tom's has given the proper guidance and what the, the, the reviewers, editors are looking for. So I wanted to thank everyone, their valuable time and uh, thanks. I don't want, and also the participant I would like to thank and also the, the, the all the people behind the scene assisting. So I really wanted to thank uh, because I think we are going to have another sessions at uh, 12 o'clock, uh, the, the uh, investment, uh, <coughs> investment 
because that's an industry keynote. I have ag agreed to meet them at 11.50. So I think, so it's only, you know, a few minutes. So so that's what I'm just, uh, just saying, but it's an interesting oh. session. And I will make sure that I will edit this, uh, the, I think we are recording this one. We will edit this and make it available in the Letro Bay page so people can uh, the, access it. All the sessions, uh, we have got the permission. Um, so we will make it all the sessions available. So thanks again. So 